I've added the LRC Meter LC1020E from Fnursi to my device collection, and today I'll take a look at its capabilities and see how accurately it measures. It's inexpensive, costing about $60. Before using the device, I'll head over to FNIRSI.com to update it if a newer version is available. I go to the download section, find this device, and see that there's a new version 1.1. I download the firmware, unzip it. Inside is a .bin file that will need to be flashed onto the device. On the device itself, I hold down the up arrow key and power it on. If the screen shows bootloader, the device is ready to connect to a computer. I plug it in, and the computer recognizes it as a storage drive. All that's left is to copy the .bin file to this drive. For some reason, my computer had a little hiccup when I tried to update via the Type-C port the device wouldn't power on afterward. So I had to connect via the USB-A port and perform the update that way. Afterward, the device powered on without any issues. The instruction manual lists operating conditions for the device. It should be used at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius plus or minus 2 degrees. Right now, I'm in the studio at 28 degrees Celsius, so there's a chance the measurements may not be very accurate. Before using the tool, it must be warmed up for at least 30 minutes, that is, turn it on and wait 30 minutes. I'm not going to do that either. I'll measure immediately. The fourth point, you need to calibrate with the channel open and closed. The kit comes with a calibration plate. Insert it, press OK, and go to the device's menu. Look for calibration. First, calibrate with the closed channel. I'll do that now, it takes some time, so I'll wait. Then remove the plate and calibrate with the open channel. For measurements, you can use Kelvin probes. They are included in the kit. This is a five contact measurement interface. For contacts, go to the probes and one contact is for cable shielding. There are also quick measurement probes in the kit, but I won't use them today. This jack is pretty big and the lead isn't flexible. Insert it into the device and slide it to the right for locking. By pressing the speed button, you can change the measurement rate. Low speed equals one measurement per second. Medium speed equals two per second. High speed equals four per second. The range button lets you select the measurement range, but you can also let the device choose automatically in auto mode. Bias is a DC offset of 0.5 volts. This offset is needed for measuring electrolytic capacitors and MLCCs. Parameter measurements are performed via a bridge circuit using AC. The AC amplitude can be 0.1, 0.3, or 0.6 VRMS. Almost all measurements are recommended at 0.6 VRMS. If you enable the DC bias offset, you can reduce the signal amplitude to only 0.3 volts or 0.1 volts. You can also change the test signal frequency. 100 Hz, 120 Hz, 1 kHz, 10 kHz, and even 100 kHz. I'll verify the output signal parameters with a Riggle DHO-804 oscilloscope. Signal amplitude 600 mV, frequency 100 Hz, 120 Hz, 1 kHz, 10 kHz, and 100 kHz. Now I'll check the amplitude at 100, 300, and 600 mV. Adding the offset increases it by 500 millivolts. Looking at this, I can say the FNERSI's output signal parameters are fine. The device has a sorting mode. For example, to sort capacitors by capacitance, first select the parameter capacitance, press OK, go to the menu, and look for sort. Here you set a target value and the allowed deviation. I have a precise 10 nanofarad capacitor, so I'll set the target to 10 nanofarads with a 5% deviation. The indication of compliance is an OK, text, plus audible and visual alerts. Choose a convenient indication mode and exit the menu. To enter sort mode, hold the hold button. First I'll try a 100 nanofarads capacitor. No alert, 
the display shows NG. Now a 10 nanofarads capacitor. The screen shows, okay, the device LED blinks once. The capacitor meets the spec. The instrument can measure the first four main parameters and five secondary parameters. Main parameters, resistance, capacitance, inductance, and impedance. Secondary, reactance, loss tangent or dissipation factor, quality factor Q, phase angle theta, and ESR, equivalent series resistance. When you select resistance, the secondary parameter automatically becomes reactance. When you select capacitance, the secondary becomes loss tangent. When you select inductance, the secondary becomes Q. When you select impedance, the secondary becomes theta. You can also manually change the secondary parameter to any you wish. To select ESR, set the secondary parameter to R. The device automatically chooses a series or parallel measurement circuit. But if you hold the speed button, you can manually choose between series or parallel. Alternatively, use the automatic mode. Resistance measurements are recommended at 1 kHz with a signal amplitude of 0.6 volts. The range is 10 milliohms to 10 megaohms with varying accuracy across ranges. Large wire resistors like this one also have significant inductance so they're best measured at 100 Hz. Typical capacitors are recommended to be measured at 1 kHz with 0.6 volts amplitude. Electrolytic capacitors are recommended at 100 to 120 Hz. The rule applies high frequency for low value capacitors, low frequency for high value. The measurement range is from 1 picofarads to 100 millifarads. For electrolytics, you also use a 0.5 volts offset. Inductors are also measured at 1 kHz and 0.6 volts amplitude. The rule is the same. High frequency for small inductance, low for large. The measurement range is from 1 microhenry to 100 henry. Now I'll move on to measurements. I have a set of inductors. These are non-precision inductors. And here's another set, precision resistors and capacitors. I usually use this board to check them with a multimeter. I choose resistance measurement and try the first resistor. 10.00 ohm resistor device shows 9.997 ohm. Next 100.08 ohm resistor device shows 100.05 ohm. A 1 kilo ohms nominal resistor shows exactly 1 kilo ohms. 999.6 ohm and 999.8 ohm on the display. The last resistor I'll measure is 99.91 kilo ohms and the device shows 99.92 kilo ohms. I can say the device measures resistors well. Now I'll measure capacitance. The first capacitor is a ceramic one of 100 picofarads. The device shows about 100 picofarads, but the readings fluctuate. Next a 1 nanofarads capacitor shows 0.99 nanofarads. Next a 10 nanofarads. Another 99 nanofarads shows 97.5 nanofarads on the screen. A 946 nanofarads capacitor shows 918 nanofarads. An electrolytic capacitor of 10.2 microfarads. Remember to discharge capacitors before testing. We measure it and get 9.29 microfarads. Try adding the offset and lowering the frequency. At 1 kHz, we get 9.28 microfarads. Lower the frequency to 100 or 120 Hz. The result is 10.29 microfarads. So it measures capacitance reasonably well, but you must understand which frequency to use for which capacitor. An electrolytic capacitor of 220 microfarads, 16 volts. It measures quickly 215 microfarads. A 470 microfarads, 10 volts electrolytic at 120 hertz, 0.6 volts amplitude, no offset result 417 microfarads. Add a DC offset of 0.5 volts result stays 417 microfarads. This device can measure both standalone components not soldered to a board and components that are soldered. Standalone components are typically measured at 0.6 volts amplitude. 
components on a board should be measured at 0.1 volts amplitude. Set amplitude to 0.1 volts. A 50 volts, 220 microfarads capacitor gives 193 microfarads. If you need to measure a component's parameters accurately, it's best to remove it from the board. I bought several inductors for measuring inductance. These are non-precision parts, so there can be even an error between the elements themselves. In the menu, I'll see 10 microhenry, 4.7 microhenry, 100 microhenry, 10 microhenry, and 2.2 microhenry, and we'll start there. Frequency 1 kilohertz, amplitude 0.6 volts. Measure a 2.2 microhenry inductor, result 2.2 microhenry. Another 2.3 microhenry. Next a 10 microhenry result 11 microhenry. Another 11.1 microhenry. A 100 microhenry marked element gives 101 microhenry. Another gives 96 microhenry. A 4.7 millihenry element. The measurement is 4.85 millihenry. Trying a different one. 4.7 millihenry. So even at 1 kilohertz, 4.7 millihenry is measured fine. A 10 millihenry element measured at 1 kilohertz gives 9.5 millihenry. Another also 9.5 millihenry. Switching to 100 hertz, it's 9.6 millihenry. Not much change, 9.8 and 9.6 millihenry. I can draw conclusions for the first parameters. The device measures resistors perfectly. The readings for capacitors differ somewhat from the labels. It's worth repeating the measurements with a test LCR meter. Inductors are standard elements. They're not precise, and the error can reach 10%. But even these results are sufficient for me to keep this device in my lab. LCR meters can not only measure inductance, resistance, and capacitance accurately, but they also measure additional parameters. For example, the phase angle, impedance angle. It's the phase difference between voltage across the component and the current through it. In an ideal resistor, voltage and current are always in phase so the impedance angle is zero degrees. In an ideal inductor, voltage leads current by 90 degrees, so the impedance angle is plus 90 degrees. In an ideal capacitor, voltage lags current by 90 degrees, so the impedance angle is minus 90 degrees. I measure a 10 kilo ohm resistor, phase shift minus 0.2 degrees. A 10 nanofarad ceramic capacitor, phase shift minus 89 degrees, almost perfect. Now let's measure a 100 microhenry inductor at 1 kilohertz. We get plus 32 degrees. If we increase the frequency, this value rises to 77 to 80 degrees also at 100 kilohertz. For electrolytic capacitors, an important parameter is ESR, equivalent series resistance. If it's too high, the capacitor may overheat and fail. In power supplies, a high ESR can cause overheating. Let's look at a 16 volts, 220 microfarads capacitor and measure ESR at 1 kilohertz. At 1 kilohertz, ESR equals 0 0.24 ohm. At 10 kilohertz, 0 0.19 ohm. At 100 kilohertz, 0 0.20 ohm. For a 16 volts, 220 microfarads capacitor, the max allowable ESR is 0 0.3 ohm, so ours is fine. A new 470 microfarads, 10 volts capacitor, ESR at 1 kilohertz equals 0 0.15 ohm. At 10 kilohertz, 0 0.12 ohm. At 100 kilohertz, 0 0.10 ohm. The max allowable for 470 microfarads, 10 volts is 0 0.24 ohm, so it's also acceptable. Parameter D is the dissipation factor, often called the loss tangent of the capacitor or the dielectric loss tangent. 
it characterizes energy losses in the dielectric and the capacitor's leads during AC operation. It's the ratio of active power dissipated in the capacitor to its reactive power under a sinusoidal voltage of a given frequency. A lower loss tangent means less energy loss, and its reciprocal is called the capacitor's quality factor. Let's measure a 10 nanofarad ceramic capacitor and see the loss tangent, 0.11 at 1 kilohertz. The quality factor, Q, is primarily used for inductors. It's a dimensionless number that characterizes the quality of the inductor, i.e., the ratio of its inductive reactance to its active resistance. High Q means low energy loss and better oscillation quality. Low Q indicates significant energy loss. Q is affected by high inductance, low active resistance, and high frequency. At 1 kHz, measuring 10 millihenry gives a Q around 1.05. Measuring 100 microhenry gives a slightly lower Q of 0.65. I'll finish the video here. If you spot any mistakes in the video or have suggestions to improve it, please leave a comment. For now, this device remains in my possession and I'll use it from time to time. That's all for now.